Hey everyone, you know, I didn't think I would miss Gawker and I had to admit that I was happy that Gawker lost the lawsuit that Hulk Holman filed against it regarding the sex tape. And it had to do with, I think more than anything, a very personal way that Gawker was, specifically Deadspin, and how they seemed rather nasty to me. And some of the nasty things they did to some people. But then when I stopped thinking about Deadspin, and also a more recent exchange I had with one of the editors that who used my Laramie Tunsil interview video, but didn't credit me. And then when I criticized them, they did credit me, but had to add in this line that I didn't know how the internet worked, when in point of fact, I know how the internet works better than they do. And specifically, well, no, I don't want to give away too many proprietary reflect approaches, so I'll just leave it at that. I got what I wanted. Or as Orson Welles would say, a citizen came, I got my candy, but I digress. I started thinking about people like, like Julia Allison. Julia is a journalist who covered tech for some years, but for some reason that I never really completely analyzed, a number of Gawker bloggers made her their focus. And the production of posts that came from this were of the, the type that you would read them and say, well, why do I, why am I reading this shit? Why do we need to know about this guy that she's dating, that she's brought into her web? What's the point? And I would see Julie at a couple of tech events. And to me, and I later blonged about this observation, she was always just trolling for white guys she thought were tech and rich. I made a point actually of expressing that idea one, one day, and boy, she hit the ceiling. <laughs> but I think she now, well, I know she then saw the point after we had a small exchange, but the bottom line is that was the impression that I got. But it was still interesting to me that Gawker invested a lot of time and energy in essentially building her celebrity. I wonder if they had some sort of secret contract. It was wild. Around that time, and this was now 2006, 7, and 8, there was also VloggerCon, and I was one of six black folks at VloggerCon in San Francisco. It was a commission of vloggers. It was fantastic. And during that time, I was on Blip TV, YouTube, met a lot of people like uh, Fred Davis, for example. Mark Cantor was there. The Andrew Michael Barron and uh, Amanda Cognon, who created Rocket Boom. A lot of great people, but I digress. Out of that, I wound up on the CNN YouTube Democratic Debates. It's a long story as to how I got there. But Kate Seeley, or Kit Seeley, a writer with the New York Times, was writing about this path-breaking event and referred to me, not by name, but as two different black men in consecutive paragraphs and referred to their two different videos, both of which were mine. I wound up contacting Owen Thomas of Valleywag about this. Owen and I struck up a friendship and he blogged about it. In fact, basically attacked her. Kit wound up writing an email back to me, an email apology, which I really appreciate. And that, but that could not have happened were not for Owen. And then at that point, Owen had not met, and I had not met face to face, but he invited me to a cocktail hour he would have at the old Ed Moose's place in Washington Square in San Francisco. It was a blast. I met a lot of really fascinating people. For example, uh, Leigh Daughtry, who was the co-founder of what you may know as Pounce, you remember as Pounce. And Pounce was actually the Twitter before Twitter. It was bigger than Twitter. But among them, I also met the incredible Sarah Lacey. At that time, Sarah was both with TechCrunch and Business Week, and now we know that she's running her own platform, Pando Daily. Also during that time, Gawker was 
stewarded by an editor by the name of Emily Gould, who was outstanding and also one of the outstanding in that she was the person, one of the persons that really helped usher in the era of snarky blogging, right? But you would call it snarky blogging, I call it sharing. All the people that I've mentioned to this day had one thing in common. They were either bloggers who shared a lot, or vloggers in my case, bloggers and bloggers who shared a lot, or either about themselves or about other people as their subjects, and they attracted attention from others who dwelled in their ecosphere, which I also did. So, Emily wrote about a friend of mine, Rachel Sklar. <laughs> and Rachel, actually, excuse me, Rachel wrote about Emily, I'm sorry, because Emily had written a blog post that was an attack on Nick Ditton. And somehow Rachel wound up getting involved in this attack Emily Gould. Then Emily went to be the editor of The Observer of Memory Serves and basically through The Observer, although indirectly, wound up attacking Rachel, to which I jumped in. I was blogging not just at Zinni, what I now call Zinni62.com, what was then called Zinni Zeitgeist, but also the San Francisco Chronicle, SF Gate City Brights area. I then jumped in and I said that Rachel was the most beautiful woman in the world, and I made a video blog to come to her defense. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. I wound up meeting Rachel in New York. We had lunch at this great vegan restaurant and to which we were not far away from the woman, Nancy Vaughn. I, I, forget, I don't want to mispronounce her last name, who was the founder of the Nation editor. And I didn't even know what she looked like at the time, but Rachel certainly didn't. The lady was only yeah, a couple of tables away. But at any rate, that was a lot of fun. I miss, you know, and the point that I'm making with all of this, and, you know, Emily and I never actually met. We became Facebook friends, but I think Emily got tired of my constant church stream of blogs automatically coming through and said, ah, I'm not going to deal with this, but I'm just like Zinni. I get you. I get you. I get you. But the whole point of all of this is that Gawker among, and also TechCrunch, and a number of people who were in the blog and vlog areas of that time, like for example, Renetto on YouTube, really ushered in the an era of sharing both vlogging and blogging. It was written about in a book called Say Anything by Scott Rosenberg. I interviewed Scott Rosenberg for 30 minutes. Find it on Zenny 62 here on YouTube. And then it found its way into vlogging on YouTube. In the early days of YouTube, the top vlogs and top vloggers were conversational. It was not like today at all. And there still needs to be a home for that. Vlogger heads kind of picks up the slack. Well, it doesn't pick up the slack. It's there, but not to the degree that it could be. There's a business model here that Gawker, for the most part, started and has never been really studied and analyzed, let alone deliberately replicated. I think it should be. But out of that created these great relationships. Well, not all of them. They weren't necessarily great. Great in that they were, it was a, something you could write a whole story of soap opera around, right? But think about it. What did all of this mix produce, either in its Gawker form or YouTube form? It produced page views and views and attention. That was the model. That's the tech. There's a model there that to this day is effective. You could say it's migrated to social media. My retort would be that no one on social media, not even Mark Zuckerberg, has really stopped to think about how Gawker and its bloggers and the early days of YouTube set the tone. If you're thinking about Blip TV, no, Blip TV didn't do that because the way Blip TV was designed was to allow you to watch a show. It wasn't for the kind of conversational exchange that was the hallmark of YouTube starting in 2006, 7, 8, 9, and before they went through the first major platform change in 10 and 11. Now, so that's the, that's what I miss, you know? That's what I miss about what Gawker did. And I think as it 
evolved over time. It got away from that and got a bit too personal. And that's where I think, and I know I take, I'll take the I think out of my sentence, I know. That's where I turned against the dead spin style because it was not where they had picked the, the Julie Allison of the day and had, you know, these posts think, that made you think, well, why am I reading this? But it's interesting, you know? No. They got to a point where they were being deliberately nasty. And that's where things changed. The sweet spot was in the golden years, the golden age between 2007 and 2011. 2011, 2012. Maybe a little early. Yeah, 2011, 2012. I'll say that. Yeah. I want to think more about this one.